Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of How Did This Get Booked? I, of course, am your host, Jake Manning. I am a veteran of the professional wrestling business for over 10 years, and I've held every single job except selling popcorn. I'm joined, as always, by my good friend, my compadre, my co-host, Zane Riley. Zane, how are you doing today? Fantastic, Jake. I saw Allison Bree boobies today. <laughs> yes, you did. You you saw them multiple times. Uh, it's really all I've just been trying to build up to in life, and it just happened. Like, I've, I've peaked today. I've peaked. You, you, you peaked today. Peaked. Well, uh, this is a special episode in the sense that we don't have a non-wrestling uh, fan joining us today. I mm-hmm. think this is one of the things we kind of do. Actually got uh, a lot of high marks on our XFL episode. Good. So like a lot of people kind of dig the fact that us as pro wrestlers, when something happens in pop culture, that we comment upon this. And, and part of the reason why we're doing this podcast is because since Glow came out on Netflix, <laughs> every one of our non uh non-wrestling people, civilians, if you will, have hit me up on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and then like, hey, have you seen Glow? Hey, what'd you think of it? Like every non-wrestling person that I know has hit me up. Even so much that I like that Darius Lockhart put a statement out. (laughs) Immediately. Immediately, the day that it came out, like, yes, everybody to know I have not watched it yet. I will watch it. I'm sure I will enjoy it. Don't Uh, ask me about it. Don't ask me about it. (laughs) Unless I post something about it. Which I... I applauded. And good for him. Yeah, good for him. <laughs> Give him the prod symbol and everything. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if, there was, if there were still flowers on Facebook, you'd have gave him a thankful. <laughs> Two hands clapping for Jesus or something. But but yeah, when anything comes like this in like the, the pop culture, I think non-wrestling fans see it, and this is probably a way for us to get our opinion out there. And so like, my thought processes was like, we had something scheduled. I was like, well, this just came out. Let's just watch Glow, get it out of the way. Because we're going to watch it anyway. We're like, going mean, wa- yeah, like, mean, to watch it anyways, but we might as well do it while it's yeah. hot. Everybody wants to know our opinion about it. So anytime we get a direct message or, or an email or somebody sees us on the street, we can just point to this podcast. <laughs> so hopefully we can up our listeners. Yeah. From, uh, <laughs> and we need to record a show. Yeah. We really, we're, and this is convenient. This, this is convenient. It's timely. It works well. Um, but as you were just saying it before I hit the record button, uh, this is going to be kind of tough yeah. because, you know, we talk about subpar professional wrestling mm-hmm. and things that aren't all that great or, you know, and that's kind of our forte is to, you know, pick at that bear or that mm-hmm. dying carcass that's been rotting for quite some time. <laughs> Bloated but, and, but and mag infested. But this is probably the best thing oh, we'll, of course. we'll ever talk about on this program. And we also don't. We don't break things down in an episodic form. Like it's, we watch two hours of something open shut. This is, there's a whole lot more avenues with this too. So the, it's going to be, but at the same time, it's all very easy to kind of gloss over because you know the high points are just, this is only takes uh, time over what, like a three week period basically or four week period. The, the actual show itself. Yeah. From, from getting, like we're going to run a wrestling show to running a wrestling show. Yeah. So. But there's like these these big arcs, exactly. You know, there's these a lot of things to talk about, and and probably like sweeping things we need to talk about, like how does it portray professional wrestling? Mm-hmm. And uh, this is part of the reason I wanted to have a female's perspective on here, but uh, couldn't have it. Is you know, like, <laughs> is this uh, a positive thing in in the world of like, is this a positive ro- female role model? Which uh, uh, I must say, uh, I do pre research like I always do, and I came across a website. It's probably the only negative review of <laughs> this uh, particular series, and we'll probably touch on a few points as we discuss the series. Yeah. Uh, I do have a couple of things highlighted from the article that I take great exception to. Yes. Um, some would. It, it's a website that I believe their motto is uh, calling out liberal biases in the media, I believe. Well, very good. Yeah, so that gives you kind of a tone. <laughs> but I, I, I don't... What are you doing on all these right-wing websites, Well, Nate? see, I don't want to label this as right-wing because I, I don't have a problem with right-wings or conservatives. I have a problem with fucking assholes. Oh, okay. There and we go. this person specifically is Definitely one of those people. And, and, and I... I 
have uh, some counterpoints okay. to to their argument. Well, hopefully they'll tune in. Oh, hopefully. <laughs> I, we'll I, just we'll just send this to them. Well, here you go. I, I, I might I might do that. I might do that. But I'm not going to mention their name or the name of the website because I don't feel like giving people power. Exactly. So. We're not putting other motherfuckers over right now. And also, yeah, I, I put enough people over right. on a regular basis. Yep. <laughs> and this fucking guy's not one of them. Yeah, but if I'm gonna put anything over, it's gonna be the show. Hey, let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, let Let's start off. Right away, because uh, with a spoiler alert that we are going to be talking about the content that is in this show, mm-hmm. the things that are going to be happening, a lot of the major surprises, uh, a lot of the twists to the it. The cameos that the you're going to see. cameos and, and all of those things to it, because I did not get that gracious uh, spoiler alert at the beginning of the article <laughs> that I read and r- actually ruined the big surprise no. of episode one. Uh, I was rather upset, and that kind of angered me through the first three episodes. <laughs> and that and, was it. And I almost kind of, like, out of spite, loved this series even more. Yeah. But then after I got past all of that rage of being of this whole series being spoiled, uh, which I, and the whole time, as someone that, like, like, like works on entertainment and, and other things, and as a writer, I'm like, ah, that would have been a great twist that I would have... I'll sunk my teeth into. <laughs> so, if you have not watched Glow, do not listen any further. We are going to tear apart. We're going to talk about all the twists and turns. Just go ahead and watch the whole thing, and then come on back. It's so, short. It's quick. It's it ten flows. half hour episodes, and yeah. that's it's like, over in no time. That's another thing too. I was concerned in jumping in this, and I saw ten episodes. I was like, oh gosh, are these hour long episodes. Yeah. But the fact that they're half an hour yeah. or thirty minute episodes mm-hmm. really seems to, mm-hmm. and everything's super tight. So yeah. you're not. It's it not, flows insanely well. They don't dwindle on anything. No, and the thing is, you have 14 women you basically yeah. have to discuss, yeah. right? who are all different, have their own things going on. Like, I think it's like episode six before we get back into discovering what goes on with Debbie. Yeah. So like, like, like I'm like, oh gosh, you're just now <laughs> getting to the main character. <laughs> the point. The, the, some of the point because you've had to set up everybody else's mm-hmm. situations, and because you're just now plugging her into this cast of 14 women yeah. so i guess we have to talk about it but like i said spoiler alert uh and assholes that do reviews on that and don't do that you're a fucking asshole because <laughs> there are a lot of great twists most specifically in episode one where uh you pre-mentioned uh allison breeze you find out allison breeze has been dead the whole time yes <laughs> <laughs> gotcha bitches exactly this is, this is just a fever dream <laughs> some would even say it's a Jacob's Ladder situation <laughs> another podcast most certainly would call it that but we're not that type of podcast but uh, yeah uh, episode one the pilot we, we get introduced to our characters Ruth Wilder and of course uh, Debbie uh, you know played by Betty Gilpin and of course Ruth played by Allison Brie yes so from from community fame I, you know, that's what I love about this is like you look at people from community, you know, look someone like Donald Glover who yeah. just, you know, uh, created the critically acclaimed show Atlanta, mm-hmm. like how well he's doing. Uh, Yvette Nicole Brown pops up a lot on like series. I mean, just a bit of like she's on a different series mm-hmm. every time. She's, nothing's really clicked yet, but she's yeah. working considerably. Oh, yeah. Same with Joe McHale. Mm-hmm. So it's nice to see everybody from community yeah. doing so well. Chevy Chase been doing it for a minute, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Not to put him over. He's she, got enough. Yeah, He's yeah, doing well. Exactly. Dan Harmon, of course. Yeah. I guess it's nice Rick to see. Rick and Morty. Yeah, exactly. New episode was two nights ago. The new Rick and Morty episode just came out. Oh, was it? Is yeah, that July that? 30th. July 30th. Holy oh, shit, this is June. Yeah. 30th. Fuck me. You haven't missed it, Sam. I did not. Well, I don't have to worry about fun now. <laughs> don't have to worry about that. Yeah, don't worry. You have plenty of time. I gotta get a calendar or something. <laughs> Count. I don't find an advocate. <laughs> Yeah, get, get like a wall calendar. Let, let, let's. <laughs> it's just it's just got Rick and Morty dates on it. That's <laughs> all it is. Well, I put Game of Thrones on my <laughs> calendar, so I can't. All right, well, back to this show. Uh, and, and electronically, I put it on my electronic calendar. Too. <laughs> I, get a, I get notifications. Exactly, but you got to start off on the ground floor. You got to have a wall calendar, then you <laughs> yeah, do it electronically. Yeah. That's how it goes. I got to I got to crawl for I can walk. Exactly, but. Uh, pilot episode. We get to introduce all these characters. Uh, of course, actress. I don't know how nuanced we want to get with this, but uh, uh, Mark Maron. Let's oh, I, he's the like the best character. Like, yeah, the best performance, hands down, was Mark Maron. Yeah, I yeah. Like, Open to close. It, exactly, because he's he is. You get a sense like he is that that yeah. particular person. And another thing in the research of this, I also listened to. 
the upcoming podcast that Mark's been doing to per, uh, kind of promote the show, but also he wanted he wanted to sit down with Genji Cohan, who was yeah. a showrunner, who also was a showrunner of Oranges of the New Black. Mm-hmm. So like that was an interview he was going to get, but he was releasing it at this time. Mm-hmm. To basically help promote Glow and get the word out about it. He also sat down with Alison Brie and Betty Gilpin. The only one that I probably won't hear that would have been nice to hear is he's doing one with Chavo. And, of course, uh, Awesome Kong, who mm-hmm. is Kia Stevens, who is Welfare Queen, Welfare Queen. In, in, the, in this series. Uh, that's actually dropping the day after we record this. So mm-hmm. I've, I've done every aspect <laughs> no, of no, Glow research to be on point. So uh, I watched the show. Yes, <laughs> but, the, but that's my rule. A couple of times because I got real drunk yesterday and didn't get to watch the last two. I mean, they played. I just fell asleep immediately. You mean Netflix didn't ask if you were continuing watching? Uh, no, I didn't even get that far into it. Like, I I got real bad day drunk at Despicable Me 3 yesterday morning, and then I went home. I was like, I'm going to finish this, and then fell asleep as soon as the episode started. Play, snore. Well, it's, it's nice that your Netflix no, Netflix knows already. I'm like, I'm not going to ask him. It basically just tucks me in. Yeah. It just is like, sleep well, sweet prince. Because sometimes I was like, hey, are you still continuing watching? And you're like, fuck, yeah. I, fuck you, I got a problem. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. It wasn't even like, I'll just go on. Oh, just go on, buddy. We'll, we'll, go. we'll be that background noise. <laughs> we'll be here when you get up. You wake up and all of a sudden there's like a Bill Burrow comedy special. <laughs> what the fuck? Who's yelling? <laughs> uh, Gypsy. Gypsy is actually what would be playing. Okay. That's what I woke up to. Mine, mine would, would uh, cycle to Chris D'Elia's new Netflix special. So. But everybody's Netflix is different. It's you know. It accounts for your alcoholism. Yes, it does. Here, but, watch this weirdly fucked up show. But yeah, it's going to be difficult because you know, normally go match by match, but going episode by episode and beat by beat might be a little difficult. Yeah. I don't think we need to go six. No, I don't think we need to go each episode episode. We well, uh, yeah. Arcs well, and stories and arcs the, and the stories. High yeah, like, I, I, you know, I've just got a couple of things outlined. Like, you know, maybe we'll we'll go up by episode, but maybe yeah. just... Here's what's short. important in that episode. Here we go. I, I've got out... I, I have notes, but then I have highlighted notes. <laughs> <laughs> i got notes from my notes. Okay, so uh, just uh, overall, we get introduced to all the characters. Uh, I think my big reactions to the, the, the first episode, the thing I look back to our discussion of Mark Maron, mm-hmm. how fantastic he is, and, uh, you know, the sexis, mm-hmm. sexism of him. Like, I'm just sitting there thinking, like, oh, i got to write some of these lines down <laughs> for a Man Scout's Revolver just character. Because <laughs> like, I, I like this, this energy. Mm-hmm. But obviously, as the series goes on, he gets a little bit more sweeter and understanding. Yeah. And, and, and human. Very personable, in a sense. yeah. You, you kind of yeah get behind him more and but the thing that i love uh the most is he keeps like falling out of the ring like every time he gets in the (laughs) ring (laughs) oh god damn it it's a production yeah which for you know people that just watch wrestling have never stepped in the ring before i'm like oh you just get in and you Mm -hmm. do it you don't realize that it actually is kind of difficult it is a bit of a uh a proposition to step into the ring well you saw like uh it would have been probably last year kevin hart on raw and he fucked up trying to get in the ring, and he ended up going in the bottom rope. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, yeah, it's very hard for people that don't practice getting in a ring, you know, every other day. Yeah, exactly. And that's another thing that, like, I remember PG-13 used to talk about how when they would, if they'd be heels, I mean, they'd piss a fan off and they'd jump the guardrail. They always knew that they'd be fine because as long as they stayed in the ring, because if they stayed in the ring, the, the fan has to climb in, in the ring, and they knew they would do it awkwardly, which is the best time to punch them in the yeah. head. Yeah, like, get your nice little boot in. Yeah, because they're completely vulnerable because they don't know how to get in, mm-hmm. so you just fuck them up right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! <laughs> which, speaking of getting fucked up, like, Allison Bree's character really gets run through the ringer in the first Jesus, episode. what a piece of shit! Yeah, yeah well, that's the thing. Like, like, the whole, basically the big, big twist is the sense that she's having an affair with a married man. Turns out it is the husband of her best friend, yeah. uh, Debbie. Yes. So, like, that's, like, the big... That was the one big... that gave it away for you and you were real hot about it? Yep. Yep. Real pissed off, because, yep. like, the, the reveal of that was so subtle and mm-hmm. so nice, and just, like... It took oh. me a couple seconds for it to soak in. That but that's just... but that's what, that's what's great about, like, little reveals like that. Mm-hmm. You don't realize... Oh. Because it was almost in passing that they they it, did that. Because that's what that's what's great about Game of Thrones. Yeah. That's what's great about like you know even some of the stuff that used to happen on Walking Dead. <laughs> <laughs> you remember when it was 
good in there. Yeah, and they didn't have to beat things over the head. <laughs> <laughs> bar, bar, bar. Uh, yeah, Before Mick Foley got there. Well, I'm, I'm not even talking about like characters. I'm just talking about storylines. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a different well, podcast. Well, we're not talking about zombie killing. We're just talking about stories. Yeah, exactly. I'm just talking about heavy-handed writing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that little nuanced thing to it just shows mm. the craft of the people who are writing it. So like, I was, I was so pissed off that that happened. Yeah. But speaking of the writing, uh, probably one of my favorite lines of episode one is... Uh, per plus bitch like <laughs> i've never heard such a perfect insult in my entire life so <laughs> love the fuck out of that um also too like i like when the uh, debbie and of course debbie confronts um ruth about uh, sleeping with her man of course it's always it always happens the man always somebody always spills the beans yeah. and it's never the main character no like, <laughs> allison brie was gonna take it to the grave nope oh nope. nope. Fucking Mark had to fuck it up. Exactly. Fucked it up. And then I like when they, they, they had the confrontation in the ring, and that's when Mark Marin's character, Sam, finally sees the potential of this thing. But uh, I think a line that I, I don't want to glaze over that I think is very interesting is one of the people on the outside, while the, the girls are fighting in the ring, somebody said, is this real? And they said, who cares? <laughs> yeah. And, like, that, that's the thing, too, is that sometimes with pro wrestling, like, real incidents happen, and real fights happen. Yeah. And you're just like, is this real? real life heat. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's like... Is this real? Like, who cares? Which yeah. is the default position of every pro wrestling fan. Who cares? Let's just enjoy this. Yeah, exactly. Which is kind of the the you know thesis statement of professional mm-hmm. wrestling. And this whole series, in this series as a whole, you know, that kind of sets up everything. Yeah, from, but, from but, then on out. Exactly. And so, like, I think that's the thing. I'm impressed by the nostalgia of the '80s mm-hmm. things. How how well they got it right. Yep. The the intro intro to episode one, fan fucking fantastic. <laughs> Fucking love everything about it. So, uh, anything else to discuss of episode one that kind of strikes uh, that, out? That's where we get the first cameo, isn't it? Uh, yes, uh, John, John Morrison, Morrison as yes. the best char- best named character ever. It was a Johnny uh, Salty Sack Johnson. <laughs> Salty Sack Johnson. Yes, the and, best. And, and I like how he comes off a little little rough, but it's it's like weird because it doesn't pair well with yeah. like Mark's energy because Mark's already kind of being the dick. He seemed like he was trying to act. Like he, you could tell that he was. Well, at least he's a wrestler. Yeah. Not to say that John Morrison's a bad actor or anything. No, no, no. You could just definitely tell his chomps weren't the same as well, I, I think that I, everyone else. Well, I thought that, but I think it was more of a, a difficult proposition for him because Mark's coming in with so much energy mm-hmm. and he's almost coming right in with him. And has to catch so up. You, so you have to figure out what path you want to end up. Like, are you the dick? Are you the hard guy? Mm-hmm. You don't want to be the nice guy because you're the trainer. So it was like a weird, wobbly platform he was standing on, but he was only really around for one episode. Yeah, so which is unfortunate. Just, and, then, so, and my favorite line from him was, holy shit, you're Clyde Jackson's daughter? Nailed it. Fuck yeah, it. that was the best line he had. It, it, that's real. It, oh, yeah, exactly. Like like that, the person he became during that part, I'm like, <laughs> that's the person I wanted to yeah. see through the whole whole time he was on screen. So but Yes, great name. Fantastic. Great job. Great uh, performance. Makes me want to see Boone a little bit. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit, a little bit. Oh, yeah, makes yeah, me yeah, ask yeah, to see yeah. Boone the Bounty Hunter. Yeah, I'll be able to see project that. project that he put together. Yeah. So. Um, and so he was... To arguably be the Mondo, yes. Because the there's a lot of like the the this is loosely based upon the original Glow. Correct? Yeah. This is not. I mean, there's not for these aren't. There wasn't really a. Uh, what is uh, the big Samoan girls? Name in Machu the, Picchu. Ma, there wasn't really a Machu Picchu. There was Mount Fiji. Yes. There, so there was like. Yeah. The, similarities. Well, that, to the actually, characters. that was a thing that the, the writers and. and and the creators of the episode of the series basically were fans of the documentary that's also on Netflix, which mm. I also watched as well. Which you might bring. I watched up. most of it. Yeah, but uh, like they were super big fans of, of that documentary, yeah. which inspired them to write this series. Okay. Which they they incorporated some of the things of that. Like there's a couple of of like melded characters together. Mm. Like uh, like um, well, the biddies were there because they showed them, yes. and then they actually became heavy metal. The character. Yeah, Where like there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of like, chainsaw like, and spike. Yeah, and... there's a lot of meshing of characters, but in like an odd kind of way, there was there was things that were like obviously like the Mondo character. Mondo Guerrero was the one that trained the original wrestlers yeah. in Glow, and of course Chavo Guerrero was the one that trained mm. these girls to mm. perform yeah. here. So there's there's that a bit of like surrealness to mm-hmm. it as well. Of course, um, also too like 
the David McLean, who was a big part of the original Glow, and then of course uh, Matt Seamer, who was mm-hmm. the director. Yeah, there, there's kind of like, and then Bash. Yeah, and then of course like there's Marion and Bash, but also too there was a couple other characters that were kind of a, a, like a, a melded together. Like David McLean's character was kind of more like Mark's character, mm-hmm. but then there was aspects. But he's really more of Matt Seamer's character. So, but Matt Seamer was kind of like more like Bash was about the stereotypes. So, like, there's a lot of combining of things. Like, I feel like Ivory was a little bit of mix of uh, Alice and Bree's character. Mm-hmm. I think Debbie was a little bit of Godiva, and also like uh, Ivory's tag team partner Ashley. So, like, there was a lot of like meshing of characters and, and melding things together and taking from this one and ma- making taking three people and making one person yeah. much like the adaptation of walking dead yeah, yeah. and the comic book yes. so i feel like that's kind of very similar to what was going on with this and so, they did a very good job yeah i think i think so and then and like we'll talk about this right now because i brought this up you know i had this later in my notes but since we're talking about it now it's a flow of things and we're, t- we're talking about women and, and, and the creators and the writers because it was two women and then they brought on jinji cohan to be mm-hmm. the uh, show runner I believe is how it's termed and put together but I believe there's two women that were big fans and wrote this and got this project going and there are like really close attention to detail of pro wrestling in mm-hmm. here, which I really particularly like like I think the wrestler got it pretty on the nose and I would say that this series is just as good if not better at it um, in, in a lot of aspects of, of getting some of the nuances to it. But like, I feel like the fact, I almost feel like because it was women putting this together, like there was a lot of women working on this project. Mm-hmm. They did women, you know, actresses, women writers, women showrunners, producers, all the, all these people. Uh, I think even like uh, there's a couple of women directors on, on some of these episodes. I feel like with men, when they see pro wrestling, they see it just as the action, and it's, that's what it is. Yeah. Where I feel like the idea of women coming at it from an emotional angle, mm-hmm. they, they they nail a lot of things that resonate with, with me particularly, because I, I always saw pro wrestling as like a performance art. Of and course. We, we draw an emotion, because I can't do all the fucking flips in the action. Exactly. So that's, that, <laughs> I quit wrestling long ago. I've been putting on plays for the last and, five, six years. And that's pretty much the story of GLOW, yeah. in the sense that, that you, you've taken actresses and trying to bring them into wrestling and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And that's another thing, too, is like I, you, you can't really... Like the, the men focus on making the, the fights look real and the action look real, especially in, in, in the wrestler. The idea is to make have the moves look all great. Yeah, but yeah. the thing is with Glow, it wasn't known for its in ring yeah. product. It wasn't the point of it. Ex- exactly. And, and so the fact that you, you're also taking actresses again and they're wrestling, there isn't like this big drop off in action. So that doesn't take you out of it. Mm-hmm. Like Mickey Rourke, like he'll do something like, oh, a wrestler would never do that in a ring. Mm-hmm. Or a wrestler would wouldn't do a head scissors like that it didn't matter because glow was mostly actresses of, of women that were just thrown in there and taught a couple of moves yeah hence like these actresses were well so there wasn't much of a a shift mm-hmm. in action because i feel like there's certain things like that when we focus so much on the action in these pro wrestling movies it's not as good as the real action that happened in the wrestling i'm like oh well this guy's supposed to be great but this guy is wrestling like a guy that's only been taught a couple of wrestling yeah. holds just for this scene mm-hmm. where like these girls were just taught a couple of wrestling holds to get through the series exactly the way Glow was. So, doing so it, I think yeah. it makes it, I think that helps with the authenticity of yeah. it. But then also too, there's, there's certain lines that we'll get into some of these episodes that just really ring home. Like, oh yeah, that right there. So I don't know if it's the fact that it's, it's done by women or it's the fact of the circumstances of glow itself mm-hmm. uh, that just kind of lend it all to kind of mesh together. But I, but there are some nuances to it that I don't know a male director or a male writer would have picked up on. Exactly. They would have focused more on the action as opposed to the emotion and the personalities. Yeah. So I, I think that's the thing I appreciate and love the most yes. about this series. So I should make note of that as well. But uh, what are some of your highlights of episode two? I believe there's one where they start training. There's also one where they do the abortion storyline. <laughs> <laughs> with, with Cherry Bang, with Junk Chain? Yeah, with Junk Chain. And, and, and we start getting uh, some more complex stuff. Also, too, from episode two, my favorite thing when, when um, 
Ruth is in the ring. She makes mention of like, oh, this is kind of bouncy. And somebody's like, yeah, if something is made of wood and steel. Yeah, which, which is, would have been uh, Machu Picchu, whatever. Yeah, which that's 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 the thing. Like when people talk about the wrestling ring, like, oh, it's just bouncy or whatever. But then like we always come like, well, it's made out of wood and steel also yeah. too. So uh, the, just that nuance of like that's what my defense would be mm-hmm. when when a girl actress would get in the ring and be like, oh, it's bouncy, like. <laughs> so stupid bitch exactly and, and then they, they discuss a lot of things about like what's fake and then put the sleeper hold on uh, which is actually, which, which is the favorite part where she chokes that bitch out which is actually a real story that Mondo, Mondo did it Mondo did yeah. it as well So that, that's and then they thing. talk about how the girls cheered for her like the Mondo choked her out we were all like yeah fuck yeah I was like, God, girls calm down yeah but, but, but she was ladies not, but she was sitting there laughing while people were trying to work so yeah. you know you gotta, you gotta hold control a little bit to bring up my, net, my my glow notes so I can keep a pace. <laughs> well, in that time, I'm going to share my favorite line from the episode. I think I've got like favorite lines for each episode. Good. Uh, my favorite line from the episode, uh, and and I was watching this with Josie, and Josie made a point to say, make sure you bring up this line during the podcast, was when Mark Marin looked right at Ruth, who is well aware of the situation with her and Debbie, and said, you're a horrible person and you don't deserve to win. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> When describing her wrestling character, like that's the home wrecker, yeah. Yeah, you're the home wrecker. You're a horrible person, and you don't deserve to win. <laughs> <laughs> he just beats her down with it. Like, and that's the thing too. Allison Brie takes a lot of shit, and the sense of like, oh, did I get the role? I didn't get the role. Mm-hmm. That was according to the WTF WTF podcast. Allison Brie actually had went through a similar situation to get hired to be on this series. <laughs> There's a lot of times where she didn't know if she was going to be in the role or didn't know me. They like, they really let her along. And actually the, the, the casting people and the, the directors and the producers were like, we weren't really that sure about you, but the more we led you on <laughs> and realized that's what the character was, like you became more of that person. The more desperate you came to get this role. Cause that's <laughs> how Ruth was. And like, Oh, she's definitely a person now. So a lot of art imitating life throughout this whole thing. And I think that's the thing, too. Much like pro wrestling, when you when you set up, like, fake situations or, or you know, choreographed situations, and then they become real. I think I think that's why, at the heart of it, 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 it rings true for someone who, like me, is in professional wrestling as long as I have been. What do you got? Uh, no goddamn signal in here. Oh, well, of course not. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah, abortion uh, storyline, which uh, uh, was very much which, And then he brings it back up to kind of yeah. add insult to injury when he's kind of going over everything. But they don't really, they never really bring that point back up after yeah. she gets initially, like, after he brings up to be a piece of shit about it. Yeah. And they just kind of let it go. Mm-hmm. Until, until he has to go have another abortion with somebody. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the thing. Like, you know, Sam is not a fucking great person. Yes. And that's what we're trying to... Because they... And that's another, a lot of the criticisms in in this article, in this mm. review, was like, oh, well, if this guy was more conservative-leaning, you would have been all over him. But because he played to the liberal playbook... <laughs> but, but here's the thing, is that people are complicated. People are shitty. And the thing is, people have to be awful to rise above to be a good person. Exactly. At the end of this series... You feel that we've seen Sam be an awful person and then become a better person or try and change his ways, but he still has that tint of awfulness that's That you there. still get it's, throughout. It's, it's more human. And, yeah, and, and yeah. a lot of the big things in the review, the the, the bad review from this this one uh, website, which the review is labeled uh, Netflix Glow excuses liberal misogyny and <laughs> racism and a fuck you to the Republican Party. Um, well, I mean, you know, fuck you, Republican Party. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> but, 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 here's, but here's the thing is that, like, they, they criticize all these characters for dropping a C-bomb, saying awful things, doing awful things, having, like, abortions, having, you know, be, be saying racist things and, and playing in that line. But, like, those people are, are saying things that people think in their head. And, and there mm. are actual people out there that say those things, think those things, act that way. And... It's out there and open and it's in display. And they're not excusing it. They're just saying, that's who that guy is. Mm. That's awful. And then he has to, like, backpedal. Like, yeah. Mark Mar- Marin says something stupid. He has to backpedal from it. Hence, when at the end of the episode two, when he's just like, hey, I'm going to give you double pay. I realize I fucked up. I shouldn't have been so shitty with you, Cherry. Yeah. Here, you, you, you're a trainer and a performer. <laughs> yeah. I, I realize I fucked up. And because you have to be an awful person to come up with it. And the thing is, too, like, I don't, I don't know exactly 
what this person who wrote the review was expecting. Yeah. You know, it's almost like they expect people to be portrayed on screen as the ideal image of, you know, Gary Cooper at high noon always does the right thing. John Wayne always mm. on the, on the side of food. Hats. Cowboys and white. I, I, impervious to any type of corruption, wrongdoing whatsoever. And almost in the sense of the way that Bill Cosby was in the 80s. You know, impervious <laughs> telling us the right thing to do, the way we should act. This is specifically to, talking about family values and, and talking how... To, to be a, a good and decent person, but as we know about Bill Cosby, <laughs> as many diddles people on the on the side. It, but even even if you if we are to take uh, take aside the the rape charges, which that is a hefty load to put yeah, aside, which is hard to do, which is hard to do. He was also, but he was known widely as a philanderer. Yeah, as well, like the guy telling you about family values was a philanderer. Yeah. Like that, that for sure couldn't be argued. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Who you the know? fuck are you to tell us that? A- a- exactly. And then also too, you add the, add the rape charges on top of that. Like who the fuck are you to tell us? And it just brings us back to who do you prefer, Bill Cosby or Richard Pryor? Richard Pryor, an obviously flawed character, made mistakes, but was open about him. Like this is who I am. Yeah. Talked about them freely. Exactly. As opposed to somebody that sits up there and says, you know, this is the way you're supposed to act, and we're supposed to do things, and we're America, you know? Yeah. And, and they and they play fun in this in this whole series throughout. There's tons of jabs like that throughout. And you take a look at some of these, you know, congressmen that say they're for family values, and, you know, I'm a, a strong Christian person, and I'm against gay people getting married, but they end up getting caught trying to solicit sex in airport from, bathrooms. From a male prostitute. You know, and, and, and that's that's where we find ourselves. Where if he would just be open, like, yeah, I, I'm i married, but I... I but a fuck. Yeah, but, <laughs> but I'm, a fuck. I'm open, and I'm, this is what I am, and this is what I like to do. You know, that that's an honest perspective, and yeah. that's an honest person. Not somebody that's hiding behind a mask or trying to portray some image who he is not. Yes. And, and, and that's what I don't want for my entertainment. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I think all art... That's out there today. All good art is is getting to the truth of the matter. Hence, why people label Hollywood as liberal and and all those things. And this takes place in the eighties. Yeah. So he's being a modern day person watching this thing that ha- took place in the eighties, and dealt with eighties situations in the way they speak and the way the culture was, but holding it to the scale of today. So of course he's going to find all these things to well, be. And, and that's the thing we forget that like you look back at some of like the, the art from the eighties and stand up and, mm-hmm. and and you realize how critical people were of Reagan and mm-hmm. some of the things that he did that we we don't know we didn't know that so much growing up as kids because yeah. he was the all American president and that was the narrative that was pushing out through all of the news media and news channels but heck you even look at the CNN. I think the CNN documentary series, the 80s, is more of an indictment <laughs> on the Republican Party than Glow was. <laughs> and some bras just taking their tits out and doing stuff about Kuntar. Yeah, between, you know, Iran-Contra and everything else. <laughs> and the Just Say No campaign and all those things. you got to take shots of those things because those things existed and not every bought, everybody bought, bought into that. Yeah. So that's that's... Pretty much what I have to say about that. But let's get into... Speaking of Wrath of Kuntar. Yeah! Um, this is where we first meet Sebastian Howard. And what better way that we have a money mark? Because every female... <laughs> all female wrestling promotion usually has a money mark yes. attached. And they don't always fly on helicopters, though. No. Though they should. They should. <laughs> and, and and Bash is most certainly set up of somebody of the yuppie generation. Yeah. And I, you know what? And my reaction through him throughout episode three is like, I don't like this guy. Yeah. I don't like this guy. He was the one that bringing up stereotypes. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, too, like, as we get to see his growth throughout the series. Yes. And, but the thing is, he gets humbled. Yeah. And that's the thing that we can get behind him more because he figured out the type of person he is where all oh, of this in episode three is a like straight bravado yes but also too shouldn't if you're a republican shouldn't you like hold up someone like bash in the way that he's acting because technically yeah. what he is doing is trickle down economics very much so <laughs> he's got old money behind it exactly and he's putting it in a female wrestling yeah. and put it in these ladies pockets there you go ladies so uh the, go to Go to the awesome party in Malibu with the drug robot. Yeah. Which I gotta get me a drug robot. There are drugs in this robot. <laughs> which That's my favorite point. part of that episode is Melrose and the other uh, Melrose and Britannica trying to get the drugs to come out when they're empty. Yeah. Is, how do we get does it just refill itself automatically? <laughs> <laughs> We're not molesting your drug robot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's that's my line of that one. For, for sure, but, not molesting your drug robot. Yeah, but but uh, but even when he's giving out like when he's talking about the characters, there's a <laughs> bit of humanity there. Yeah, this doesn't make me hate Bash so much. Yeah, like he, you just kind of come. He he comes across as just kind of stupid. Yeah, and more than big heart, just real fucking dumb. Yeah, and, and that's how most money marks are. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> the intentions are well, but you're stupid. Yeah. And, and, and you pick the wrong person to be in charge, which is Sam. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's basically where we're at. And, and then we then we get into both of them doing like coke hardcore the whole time. Which but leads, they're both on different downward spirals. Which leads right into episode four, where they do coke and they come up with the idea that everybody <laughs> should stay at a hotel. Yeah. Which kind of was a little bit of Glow's thing, but they all stayed at the Riviera. Yeah, and they were separate we had and they were so. around. And also too, like they were very much a tight knit group. I remember. Mm-hmm. Talking with Ivory one time at a convention, I think I was running her autograph table line or whatever. She was talking about talking about Glow and how like they would get on a, like a bus tour like for like touring shows. And she talked about how like she goes, I saw those ladies so much. I wasn't. She goes, I was dating somebody when I first went into Glow, and then I went on tour with these ladies, and I came back, and I was like, I'm not really interested in this guy. <laughs> <laughs> like it was just one of those things. It's just like you know what? Like I just kind of grew past it, and I, I'd already changed so much because yeah. I was around these people all the time, and these were the people that helped form my opinions and thoughts and stuff like that. Not this. Uh, not my boyfriend, mm-hmm. who I just kind of left in the dust to go do this crazy thing. So, like, these girls became very much a unit and a team, which is kind of what we're trying to get into in the series and putting them all in rooms. And that's where we come up with all the interesting stories that uh, shake out. Which, which I didn't get. Like, so they're like, there's no guys here, no drugs, and all this stuff. But somehow Cherry Bang was able to bring Keith with her. And like they never even said anything about it. They never like touched on the subject. Yeah. The Keith just living there. Yeah, there was a little bit. Uh, I'm sure like, there was like. A what cut. are you doing here? Oh, I'm living here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, cool. Should, yeah. Shouldn't well, shouldn't like like Kia's character be pissed off? Like, <laughs> yeah. I got kids. Yeah. Like, like, <laughs> like fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> and this yeah. is before he even gets the ref job, so it's not like he's part of the family yet. Yeah. Um, also, too, it, should, it might be an interesting time. I mean, in my notes, I was talking about like uh, like like boobs being and, and nudity put out yeah. there. That was another criticism of this this bad review that I've referenced a couple of times. Was like, oh, they could just put you know tits out to whatever. And that's supposed to be empowering to women. I, I the thing that I have to say about the nudity part that I find interesting is it's like it's just it's just like there. Yeah, like it, it's not like it's not there. To it's be, not heralded to be sexual. Yeah, it, like, it almost because they're not done in sexy moments it's just it, it, it's transitioned from one thing to the other that you just barely me as a normal person just barely acknowledge fact other than the fact that it's oh there's Alice and Priest boobs I always want to see those cool deal now on to the show yeah it's nothing like, that I'm just like putting on a pedestal like oh my fucking god this yeah. is awesome oh, oh yeah well, there's more tits coming no don't get me wrong there are some awful men in this world that are probably <laughs> yeah. rewinding well, fast of forward of course yeah you know, but that that exists yeah but in the sense this is that, just the nature of the world but the fact that it's just kind of there like yeah. it, it happenstance like yeah that's what, what would happen yeah and that's yeah, in that situation. There's all these girls around that have to put on different outfits. Of course a tit's going to pop out. Exactly. Much in the same sense that... You're weird for writing about it. Exactly. Much in the same <laughs> sense I've seen Billy Gunn's dick before. Yeah. That's, that shit's fucking happened. Dude, I'm a legend checker. <laughs> I want to know. I'm like, what's up, man? Yep. That's like, what your dick looks like. Yeah, like, like, like that. You ain't shit to me now, boy. I know what your boner looks like. Let's go. <laughs> Who the fuck but are you? Th- that's how it is in locker rooms. That's when people change. That's yeah. just how it happens. The scene takes place there. Yeah. And, and it's, it's it, yeah, it's not sexualized. It's just, no. it's just there. And shouldn't we get past that? Because that's just how it is. Yeah. And also, too, like, the only reason it, it's hung up and people get hung up about it is because us as Americans are hung up on sex. Yeah. You know, we're not hung up on violence like other places. Yeah. And if... The roles were reversed. If America was hung up on violence as it was sex, then pro wrestlers would be viewed in the same light as porn stars. Yeah. So I've always I've always made that analogy as well. So like and also too, like in eighties films, like boobs were just out there as a joke. Yeah. And that's what I love was like, oh Oh my gosh, I get hit by a boob or... <laughs> it's 80 titty time. 80 titty time. Another reason why that was a case, which I just found in another podcast, the reason why there were so many boobs in it because international markets. No. Oh. 
because they're like they had to have like certain because they weren't as hung up on as we were. Yeah. So sometimes the international version would have more boobs in it, but it'd be more happenstance because mm-hmm. you can't just sexualize put put boobs in it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it had to be used as jokes or like, yeah. oh god, I walked in the wrong locker room. <laughs> oh no. It, it was a lot. Of, it was a lot of that. So. Yeah. Which is fun, and hence why it's based in the '80s, and why it's just like, yep, they're just there. They're there, so even better. Um, and it's not like these were fucking like fake titted out girls. They were just trying to just put out there, like, oh, this is a good time for titties. This is a real human this being. This is just a person. This is this is no different than, than anything else. Yep. Gravity know? and everything. Here they are. Exactly. So what? Yeah. It, 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 much like in the sense of like, I remember. The movie When a Man Loves a Woman, which is about Meg Ryan, who played an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. My mom watched that movie, and it was rated R. And my mom was super fucking pissed off. Because she's like, I don't know why the fuck this movie is rated R. <laughs> she goes, the only thing that's in it that could be rated R is the fact that Meg Ryan's butt was out. She goes, it's a fucking butt. <laughs> fucking get over it. It's a butt. <laughs> she goes, there's no reason. Just fucking get over it. It's a woman's butt. <laughs> Women have fucking butts. Like... <laughs> Who come from there? Congratulations. Yeah, it, like my mom was just insanely upset. <laughs> Did your mom write a review? She's like, get the fuck over it. Women have butts. Which yeah. I think this is... She one of the one star reviews for When Man Loves a Woman on Amazon? She was just mad at the ratings board. She's just like, this is a great movie and everybody should see this. <laughs> like, Don't Ryan, let the butt stop you. Yeah, Meg Ryan and Andy Garcia believe that love story. <laughs> <laughs> So fucking butts. But uh, now we're having another proper discussion about Welfare Queen because there is a discussion Whoa! in this one. So <laughs> yeah, uh, there's actually uh, Welfare Queen is actually an actual term. And when I heard it, I'm like, it made me flash uh, back to a podcast I listened from the Dollop. The Dollop has an entire podcast about the person who was labeled Welfare Queen. There was one woman that really took advantage of the system, even even before the benefits of welfare, took advantage of the system at all turns and, and points and became a very sensationalized case. Mm-hmm. And Ronald Reagan himself used the term welfare queen and brought up this woman's example to help get him elected to talk about and, and to cut off benefit towards poor people that needed it mm-hmm. which is it which is a, a subject that's close and dear to my heart because i've been on food stamps before yeah and like the idea of public assistance like like i know what that feels like and some of the people that are on it don't necessarily want to be on it but they have to be mm-hmm. on it and that's kind of where we are especially with even with healthcare as well it's another discussion as well but you know, the discussion of like playing to that stereotypes and pulling that emotion out of people, you know, like that's that exists at this time. So like in this time, the idea of a welfare queen very much makes you the heel, much yeah. in the same sense of Beirut and everything else. And that's <laughs> kind of, that's kind of the point is that like, you know, playing upon stereotypes, making people feel uncomfortable. That's the discussion. of it. Yeah. That's the discussion that's kind of being made is like, they see you as this, but you're not this. Yeah. And that's the, and, and since you're the right person to make this reference, that's why we're doing this. Yeah. And this is a hot button topic. It's not out of poor taste. It's just out of very digestible situations. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very uncomfortable situation that needs to be discussed yeah. in society. So mm-hmm. that's, that's why we're bringing it up, mm-hmm. you know? So, and that's probably something that people would see an assumption by looking at her. Yes. You know, the people would make that assumption about her when she is not that at all. Yeah. And the fact that she's not that at all turns that stereotype more on its head. Exactly. Which, and everything with professional wrestling, much like my Andy Kaufman-like character in Revolver. Mm-hmm. I play a super sexist pig and i have to up it every time yeah because fuck uh we have politicians saying far worse on yeah. cnn so, politicians you mean the president <laughs> well i didn't want to go there but let's do it he's not listening exactly he, he might, might be, be. Fuck <laughs> i don't know <laughs> it's not like he's doing anything he'll tweet us if he is yeah but 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 it's the idea because there is that tension right now because they're and and a woman just had a very contentious election, and mm-hmm. I'm trying to capitalize upon that, and I'm trying to instill that anger in mm-hmm. people, and I'm trying to be an effigy of that. And part of the reason of it is I have women coming after me. Mm-hmm. That was the thing about the Andy Kaufman's thing that I think you can take uh, kind of a, a criticism to is that the person that saved the day was a man, Jerry mm-hmm. Waller, at the end of the day. Where I say something shitty, it will always be a woman, a woman who is qualified enough to kick my ass. Mm-hmm. Which, the last woman I wrestled was Allison, Allison Kay, who takes Muay Thai, kickboxing. <laughs> could legit kick your ass. Probably could kick my ass. 
And also, too, like, the, the quality of women's wrestling is far better now than it was during Andy Kaufman's time. So I can have far more competitive matches, mm-hmm. but I can come at it from a much more harder angle, angle where Joey Ryan comes at from a more playful angle, yeah. where I, I am very much a person that likes getting actual heat, mm-hmm. making people actually angry, yeah. and then giving them a reprieve. Creating the tension again, give them a preve, <laughs> and then and that's how professional wrestling works. Yes. And and at the same time too, I I'm comfortable in doing that because I help out with Queens of Combat and, and I fully support these women. And also too, some of these female professional wrestlers are far better than some of the dudes I would probably no wrestle. So like I want to have better matches and I'm gonna have them with females. Yes. And that's the angle I'm coming from. So me coming out as a sexist pig and everybody thinking that when actually I'm not you can create the highlight reel. Turns the fucking stereotype on its head and that's what I that's, and easier for you to embrace and Hence, what is doing with what do I hate? Now let me let me replicate that. Yeah, exactly, and and let me do it in a disgusting way Mm -hmm. and in a crass way, so you hate it just as much as I did. Yes. Hence, why Welfare Queen's character is is put in there, and hence why professional wrestling is so great is because of those stereotypes. Is turning it around. I don't know if the the series articulates that point quite Mm -hmm. as well. There are a lot of points, but at the same time, too, that's a very nuanced point. That's a very critical point. That's a a large discussion piece that that you can do. We're really right now, where what are we talking about? Like episode four? four? We got to introduce these characters and we got to move on. Much like this podcast has to move on right now. We meet Goliath Jackson here. or Yeah, Goliath Jackson and Tyrese and Carlito. Yeah. And, and the, but this is also ties into the, the fact that of a woman deciding what she wants mm-hmm. to do. She, you know, and that's the thing too. At the time, female wrestlers were not well respected. Yeah, he even the, says it. You're a sideshow act, like the midgets, which is very much the case at that time. You know, I think WWE and has been the case almost until recently. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. This actually during this time would have been the last time that female wrestlers would even had an opportunity because mm-hmm. this would have been '86 which would have been roughly about the time of Cindy Lop- mm-hmm. Lopper, Wendy Richter. And then a few years after that, the women's title was phased out completely yeah. from WWF television. So, like, that, and that's not very odd, too, is that, you know, about the time it got closer and closer to the steroid trial and all those things, it starts to fade. They just fade out women completely, which don't you want? You would want more women there now to... Yeah, when because you're trying to phase out the big juiced up monsters, yeah. don't you want to bring the women back? Yeah, it's just because girls out here. Which they didn't really do till like '93, which is kind of when that happened. Yeah. So I guess that kind of opened the door. But as soon as that got cleared up, they just pushed it away. Right back out. Yeah, they, exactly. So yeah, at that time they're very much the side But yeah, we see Rodas Clay and Carlito pop up. Um, I think my line that I have is. I embody an asshole to be a better wrestler, which <laughs> kind of sums up our entire conversation that we've had for the last 15 minutes. Uh, episode 5, Debbie does something. This is finally where we get to like get Debbie's journey. Yeah. She's just now being interjected into, into wrestling. Into, into the wrestling it, it itself. And sees her first live show. Yeah, which, by the way, also too, like the, the, we glaze over the scene with Mark Marin and Debbie in the kitchen. Yeah. Very powerful scene. Yeah. Like, I was in on both these characters. I didn't want to like Debbie because I'd already had an affinity towards Ruth's character because yeah. eating shit is something that I do on a regular <laughs> basis where I felt like Debbie had a lot of things handed to her. Yeah, so, exactly. So once she got cheated on, I didn't give a fuck yeah, about Yeah, like, Which, suck it up. God yeah. damn. You're so, still hot. You can get out there and do better. Exactly. And so, like, you know, now we get to see Debbie's journey. Now, yeah. And we get to change that. That's also where, this is also the episode where Ruth discovers the Russian character mm-hmm. and... and you know, the fun of that, but this is also where we get to see a wrestling show that takes place at American Legion Post 308 in Reseda, California. Hmm. What happens there? Uh, I hear a pretty prestigious wrestling show. That people... Oh, that little wrestling show that like James Franco was at not too long ago? And Ron Funches and, and Matt McCarthy yeah, and, you know, and Sofia guys. Vergara uh, and Joe Manganiello. And, and that uh, Ronda Rousey lady has been yeah, there. Yeah, a time or two. You, you know. You might have you might have heard of that, that wrestling building uh, on TMZ a time or two. Man, fuck them. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you can see... Uh, Frankie Kazarian and Christopher Daniels <laughs> in the Curry Man pants. In the cur- <laughs> he must have borrowed those from. Curry <laughs> he Man. must have he, real good friends. Real left good left friends. his gear out. Uh, for some reason lately, I've forgotten socks twice on a show because I probably had to borrow socks. He probably had to borrow tights. I got to borrow socks sometimes. Yeah, that's how that works. 
That's how it works in pro wrestling. Um, Joy Ryan as Mr. <laughs> Mr. Monopoly, Monopoly. Uh, which is funny because I've always fashioned myself as a poor man's Joy Ryan, yeah. but I look more like the Monopoly, Monopoly. man yeah, than yeah, Mr. Yeah, Monopoly. Yeah, yeah. So uh, a yeah. little bit of eeriness there. Also, mm-hmm. too, uh, Steel Horse, played by yeah, Alex, Alex Riley, Riley, who Riley, yeah. is my only uh, WWF dark match. Oh. So it was good to see him and see that he's doing so well. <laughs> he's for doing himself. well. He's doing far better than I am. So uh, like, that's, that's good to know. Joey Ryan's valet was his wife. Yes, uh, Laura, Laura Grace James. James. I don't know. I, don't know. I, uh, I thought it was James. You got, I, might be. Might be. I might be talking about the against me lady. <laughs> okay. I don't know why that 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 right. Yeah. Uh, break in there but anyways uh i, I liked uh steel horse's speech where he talks about oh we're not friends mm-hmm. that like that hits home as well of course yeah you know what I'm real saying? hard you know and that's the thing too is like cause there's many people i've been in the ring with who i don't like and we just gotta do it and it's a job and we have and you do really well and i think it's a very and that's another reason why i was like good to see alex riley he had a very pivotal scene that i think yeah. kind of pushes it shapes the re- the second half of the the season right? yeah because, Second half of the show because it's it's that idea of like Debbie has to get over the tension that it because there's big tension and that's what I liked about the infidelity that's why it's so it was so upsetting that I found you know like ah it was spoiled by me because it was such an integral part of the show and that tension throughout the show continued even to episode 10 mm-hmm. and really kind of formed the big struggle that was going on on top of the struggle of putting together a wrestling show. And like like Debbie and Ruth's conflict of having to get over this and the ups and downs, there are always ups and downs mm-hmm. to that. Yeah. And, and, and like left turns and they can never get back and then they get to the point at the end. So, but yeah, I really dig the, you know, Alex Riley's entire part of this. The only thing, and this is the only, this is the first complaint oh. that I have of, of the entire series is, and this has done a lot. In, in shows uh, about professional wrestling, I, but I'll get to why I guess it was important to do it this way, is the idea of profession of private dressing rooms <laughs> at professional wrestling. Yeah, shows. yeah, okay, I can get on board with that. Uh, it, it is oh every time that every, everybody has their own private dressing room. Not the case. <laughs> like if that was a real. Indie uh, show. American Legion. Oh. Every, well, I guarantee that room, all of the four us are in that room anyways. That is the bar in the back of the American Legion. Yeah. Like <laughs> that, that like, they always have. Yeah, like that, like there'd be 30 other guys in yeah. that room. But Nobody's fucking in that room. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, he might have been the last person. Yeah. He also might have been a big wig, which uh, I've been on shows before where Buff Bagwell has to have his own separate dressing room. But so, it's like a closet. Yeah, but, it's, <laughs> but that's like his insistence actually gives him a worse dressing yeah. room as opposed to this nice state-of-the-art locker room. He ends up in a broom <laughs> closet because yep. he has to have his own dressing hope room. Hope you feel better about yourself, Buff. I hope you feel so. hope so, too. Happy <laughs> retirement. Yeah. <laughs> I bid you adieu. <laughs> Moving on to ma- uh, episode six. Match. Match. Sorry, old habits are hard to break. Episode six. This one. This is one of those moments. Um, they. This is where Debbie and Ruth come face to face with each other, and they say heel and face. And that. This is another one of my complaints. Is wrestlers don't use the words heel and face. Yeah. As as much as they did in this dialogue. Yes. Um. But. And it just it sounds like. Nails on a chalkboard when I hear something. Oh, yeah, say, yeah, like, yeah, that's how I felt about it. Wrestler too. terms. Like, yeah. even if they are wrestlers, I'm still just like, oh, shut the fuck up. Yeah. Bro, I'm going to do this and get heat on you. Then you get the get. Uh, like, uh. <laughs> Come on, that's not yeah. how we speak. But shortly after that, Ruth actually calls a match pretty accurately. Like, yeah. You know, like that. The, she, which she's always, she's like wrestling herself. Yes. Yes. Like, when she does that, like, I, it, that's exactly the way I call a match. Yeah. Although, there probably could be a few more fucks in there. That would oh, be, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, yeah, I'm going to hit you with the fucking deal, yeah, and then yeah, come yeah, fucking okay. come back. And then it's and like, fucking, whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah, and fucking then, uh, this, uh, and you do the fucking deal. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you put a few more fucks in there, and, yeah. that, and that is... Dead on. Perfect. And that's another reason, too. Like, nobody... They don't put that in, like, other movies and stuff yeah. like that, like calling, so... So when we start... When we make that wrestling movie of ours... Yeah. When that, we get that R rating for butts and fucks yeah, used... Exactly. So... Every fuck was given. Uh... This is, uh... Uh, I just got a few notes and stuff like that. And then she walks out, and they give her the day off, so she goes to the brisk with the uh, with her Russian friend from the lobby, which is a nice little scene. And yeah, it, it, it gets something across. Yeah, and then like Ruth, uh, like comes back and realizes she's not going to work with Debbie, and Debbie's looking for opponents. And, and fuck, it gets right back to fuck Debbie here. Like yeah. all, all the all the bill that she's kind of done to be a better person, you kind of feel sorry for. Her. 
mega cunt time where she's just like, oh, I'm not going to work with her. I don't want to work with her. I don't want to work with her. Yeah. Fuck yeah. her. Exactly. A little bit of that. And, and then like, Ruth rolling with it being like, well, she doesn't want to work with me, so I got to figure something else out. It's true stereotypes. That was yeah. a little, that was a little yeah. rough. Yeah, <laughs> a little rough with her with her yentl mom deal going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that was the only uncomfortable stereotype <laughs> of the whole thing. But, but you were fine with the Russian stereotype. Yeah, I was fine with that. For okay. Because <laughs> Russians haven't eaten that much shit over the years. Yeah. Not as much as, say, the Jews. Yeah, so, like, that was a little, a little weird there, but then they finally realized that U.S. Russia, and that's what it ever yeah. we get to episode seven, live studio audience, uh, the, the lineup <laughs> written down just as it would anywhere yeah. else. That, that yeah. I think that attention to detail yeah. is very important. <laughs> um, My name's in parentheses for her. <laughs> Um, also, too, uh, they go to train with Brodus Clay and Carlito. Yeah, doing that crossbody. Yeah, for, for, for Debbie and Ruth. Um, although, no, one, this is another little slight thing, is that vets would not be that eager to bump yeah. when training somebody. Yeah. Like well, they're, they're not vets. They're, they're, they're still in the game. They're still... The dad would be the vet. They're just okay. wrestlers. The, the, okay. I, they're, I, they're still young, bright-eyed, I, bushy tail, going to make it to the Fed one day wrestlers. Okay, I'll buy that. I'll buy that. <laughs> So I, that's the only reason. But what I don't think would happen, there wouldn't be that fucking mattress there. Yeah, that yeah. mattress would not have occurred because they'd want to, they'd want to toughen them up as much yeah, as possible exactly. and show them the deal. But but at the same time too, th- that's another thing too. But I don't mind that as so much because they spend a lot of time showing this long training montage. Mm-hmm. But it's like over several sequences. Just I like it because it shows how difficult professional wrestling is. Yeah, it's just not like. You know, DJ. Just do it. It's just not like, like DJ Tanner walking in at Full House and giving people like tilt the world heads. Yeah, exactly. Like I like that, I like that they show that it takes some practice. <laughs> We're gonna have to do a ten minute episode on just that episode of Fuller House, aren't yeah. we? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But like that's what I like about it is it, is it takes. They show that it takes a lot yeah. of time to get so it so right. much time. In fact, they had to do a montage and, and repetitions and yeah. stuff like that. And, and I like it. And, and it being bad and getting better and better and yeah, or not so bad, not so bad. Exactly, and I think that that's what I like about it. But then I get the they're the running the show. Uh, everybody comes out to the same sappy piano music. Yeah. Sheila playing her playing the music. Can you play piano? I can play piano. Yeah, which it, and which is no different than the Mooresville Armory shows where I ran yeah. with George South, where we all came out to like a virgin because he didn't want to change the CD. Mm-hmm. So. Like that. This is also where we get the KKK white sheets thing in, which was awesome. Like them talking about like. Should we be able to do this? And they're like, oh, no, because they're black. It's okay. Yeah. And then, like, but it's... See, I saw it right away. Like, I, I picked on what was going right away. But I liked that it took a minute. Like, then there's the big reveal of them putting the hood on. Yeah. Like, like you see it, and you're like, oh, they're not going to. Yep. Yeah, going sure to. are. But this is I, happening. But 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 then I like in, in the, the the next episode, like the first thing at the top, they go, <laughs> that was great. That was fantastic. But on no fucking planet will we ever do this. <laughs> Love the black people. Hated the KKK. <laughs> oh, I figured you'd like the KKK. <laughs> yes. What? I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of great lines in yeah, Mark yeah. in this episode. Zing, and, Zinger City. And Zinger's in the next one as well. But uh, but that's when the crowd actually starts getting into it. Yeah. It's with the, the the blacks versus the KKK. Because you can, you definitely hate those people. Yes. Which goes back to my point of you have to be this effigy of hate. And they also said it like, well, it's okay because we're not this way. I mean, they even said what we just spent a couple minutes talking about. Well, These girls just, well, the black people asked us to do it, and we don't believe in this. And they're not going to see our faces. Well, Edward <laughs> Norton has to be a, a, a harsh racist in the beginning of American History Exactly. X. He has much, and Leonardo DiCaprio has to drop the N, N-word a shitload of times mm-hmm. for you to really fucking hate him in Django. Django, yeah. So that's, you have to have a genuine bad guy mm-hmm. that instills genuine hate, and that's exactly right. That's where it turned the whole... Tied of everything, mm-hmm. but in the next episode of saying, like, this will never fucking happen, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's an important thing to yeah. do. But also, another thing, a takeaway from episode seven is the glow rap. Yeah. Which, in, in the documentary, they, they did that in the original glow because Super Bowl Shuffle was very popular. Yes, because the Bears were doing the thing. And, and white people rapping as well. Was, you know, it was kind of a popular thing. Speak, we're, we're speak rapping. Speak rapping. I, I we're talk like, singing as well. Speak singing, speak singing. I, I did like that that little nod to it as well. Mm-hmm. But uh, episode eight, uh, should we start off with Debbie's husband comes back, talks about therapy. This is also where we discover Ruth is pregnant. Oh. which that's a that. So we've got all kinds of little left turns <laughs> yeah. in their relationship, and that's I think things you can see were coming. Yeah, things that made you think, where's this gonna go? 
Um, My biggest take from that was, holy fuck, pregnancy tests were complicated as shit back then. Which is, which is another thing that we gotta get. It's another appreciation us as men. Yeah. Like, okay, yeah, that really sucked. Yeah. Okay. Waiting for half an hour just to. Yeah. Do do all that, but uh, also too, this is where we see Mark Marin butt cheeks. Yeah, which butt cheeks. Mark Mark Marin talked about in his podcast. He was like, when he read that and saw that, he's like, yeah, it, it's only fair. <laughs> he's just like everybody else is new to this thing. It's only fair that you see my butt, even though I'm not the type of person. I'm not the sex symbol here. Yeah, it's only fair that in this context of like, yeah, I'd be naked in this situation. Yeah, and and he even said too, his only his only note was like, yeah, I have to make knowledge of the mess <laughs> <laughs> of the situation, which was you know sparked one of my favorite like Jesus Christ is like a crime scene. Down here. <laughs> so you know, and, and like yeah, he has to make knowledge of it. So, this is also Sheila's birthday, yeah. and it's like this is a real unifying episode. Yeah. Which I, I really love the Sheila character, and that you only see for like two seconds that that's not how she really is. Like she puts that makeup on and she fucks her teeth up like that on purpose, and you see that in an earlier episode. Yeah, but like it's like everybody pulls together in yeah. this one. We're at the same time too, like Ruth's being pulled apart, mm-hmm. and she can't really go to anybody really. But she goes to Sam. Yeah. And, and, and like those scenes together. Another humanizing scene for Sam. We go, one for the good guys column. Exactly. And also he's being a monster with, with his, with Britannica's relationship. Yeah. So you need a little bit of a humanization mm-hmm. of, of him and stuff like that. And, and that's the thing. It's like, this is his growth. And he's actually going to be sprung into a whole shitload yeah. of growth. This isn't shit yet. Yeah. like, the, But you, we had to make him a human. Yes. Like we have to take him back. And, and at the end of the day, it's like really the only person that Ruth can call upon. Yeah. And no she judgment. She doesn't have anybody else. And, and just like, no judgment. Just, I'm here for you. Yeah. And, and and the questions that the doctor asked before she has the abortion are really the only questions you need to ask in that situation. Yeah. Have you have you explored every option? Are you sure this is one I do? You realize it's permanent. Yeah. Yeah. That's all we need to do. So, on to episode nine. Uh, mm-hmm. Probably uh, this reviewer's least favorite title of an episode: "Liberal Chokehold." <laughs> uh, <laughs> start off with the Lebanese terrorists. We get into the, the KD. The... Uh, TV meeting where Bash finally appears <laughs> after weeks. <laughs> which uh, I got the high school on Burger Time. Which he describes the money has run out. Which sparks one of my favorite lines and truest lines. What comes with everything pro wrestling? With when, when Mark Maron's character Sam says, "When the money is, when there is no more money, it's over." Yeah, and that is the truest fucking statement up out of professional wrestling. <laughs> Ever and, and that is where we put the, that on the flag. Where, where, where that's the thing. Where the, I think also too, like the the writers can identify to that as well when mm-hmm. making series and stuff like that. You can identify with that right away. Anyways, mm-hmm. uh, we get to the big the fundraiser. We're, that we're, we're trying to do the car wash first. Oh, we're doing the car wash as well. It doesn't work. They make two hundred bucks. Two hundred bucks, but then like Bash comes with the idea of going to the just say no fundraiser, mm-hmm. and, and, <laughs> and everybody talk about how they're on crack. Exactly. <laughs> oh, and crack. But but then relating to but like you know Ruth, you know speech, it hits. Hard. It's true. Yeah, it's true. It rings true. Minus the fact of the crack. Yeah, minus the fact of the crack. But at the same time too, which like it, crack is merely a metaphor mm-hmm. in this situation. <laughs> Um, Crack is just bad decisions. But, uh, and like, and then of course, Mark Marin d- doing blow on uh, the picture of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> uh, with, the, with the band that tells him his movie has already been done. Yes. Uh, and then he turns out that uh, his, one of the wrestlers is his daughter. And Justine. He to, yes, he has to deal with all of that now. So, yeah. A big pill to After fuck. he tries to fuck her. Yes. Yeah. After he tries to give her a little dick, and then but but like that's a big swerve as well because yeah. I didn't see that coming. Yeah, I thought well. she was. I always thought she was just going to try to fuck him at some point. Yeah, like when when he when she finds out like her Britannica him and Britannica are broken up. Like, yeah, oh, thought, it's thought, fuck time. Yeah, I thought that was a thing, but at the same time too, that would make sense because she would have serious daddy issues mm-hmm. and she'd be looking for. She she wouldn't want it. Much like a stepmother situation, yeah. you wouldn't want this woman having sex with your dad. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're too close to me. This yeah. is too weird. I don't want that. But you really find out it's not because she's jealous of the attention. She was, well, she's jealous of the attention, but she's not mm-hmm. jealous of the sexual attention. She's jealous of just the attention in general. I feel, I feel that we've glazed over an important character. Uh, someone that I hate the entire series. Uh, that's one Billy Awful, spelled O F F A L. Billy Awful was the pizza delivery boy. Oh, yeah. We've, we've, we've <laughs> that Justine was in love with. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, Spider's but, a sweet little character. He's you know, a simple character. Yeah. Nothing. Didn't talk about him, though. I just hate him so much for his, how his, his puck name is spelled O-F-F-A-L. Of course it is. Awful. Get oh, out of here. Of course it is. Now on, to, now on to the season finale, episode 10. Money is in the chase. We get to that reason why it's labeled that in a minute. But very much in real life, putting on a show is very stressful. Mm-hmm. Loading up. Stre- like the idea of like, we have to have everything. The idea of bringing a sewing machine. What if we need to like fix the gear? You can't sew it by hand. Yeah, and that, part of the reason why I keep a socket set in case the ring ropes broke, which they did. But they sure so did. like, if you had a socket set, you could have fixed that. So, um, But yeah, they, they get the ballroom. Uh, after they lo- after they couldn't get that really awesome fucking Aztec the- Mayan theater or whatever that was. Was that the Lucha Underground set? Uh, I think that might be where Lucha Vavoom runs. From okay, that's right. It was. I think it was Vavoom. I think I think, I think Vavoom that. runs there, and I think yeah. that's part of the reason why. And that's another thing too. That's kind of nice is they they use like indie wrestling landmarks yeah. because it's real and genuine. They, 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 they didn't they didn't book a building that would normally have wrestling yeah. in it. You know, like they they booked wrestling, they booked build, they shot buildings that would have wrestling in it. Yes. And like a ballroom and everything else, like that's genuine as well. And ballrooms is kind of where Glow started. So, like, I'll give you a ballroom. And of course, they had the cameras and the work, putting all that together. Um, uh, One thing I didn't like with the show and some of the matches and stuff like that. Um, is that the talking in the ring is always very overdone mm-hmm. in TV shows about pro wrestling. Like, they're having full-on conversations yeah. while they're wrestling. Like, you might get a quip here and mm-hmm. there, but you're not going to get multiple sentence yeah. dialogues. <laughs> We're not getting our shit in right here. Wh- wh- which was <laughs> my big critique of... Uh, a movie we were scheduled to do, which is uh, the Jesse B- the Body Ventura uh, yeah. movie dramatization dramatization TV movie uh, about his life, which we'll probably do down the road some point in time. But that was uh, a big thing of that one. There was, was a just lot of, talking the whole time. They're having full on conversation like, "Hey, how's your wife? What's going on here?" and stuff like that. That might have been the case in the old days where you could hang on to a hold for twenty minutes, but that is Nothing never more. the fucking case right now. No. I, I I may have has said a joke or two in a ring to somebody, <laughs> but that's about it. <laughs> you know, so like talking is always overdone. Like I think Cherry having a discussion with her, uh, you know. Husband, Keith, Keith. Did, did in the ring. Now there will be there will be that thing like the referee yelling. That at, was good. Like I thought Keith did very well at that. Yes, the yelling was like you guys are doing so fucking good right now. But yeah. it looks like he's admonishing. Yeah, that happens. Yeah. a lot. And also referees that are very overexcited by situations will be that <laughs> say that exact line yeah. perfectly. Uh, Machu Picchu's. Uh, success, whole, and success and accepted by there, her father. Yeah. That's a nice little fucking story. Yeah, but especially since she ran out early in the uh, the, the, the 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 first show Try they tried run. to do, she yeah. she couldn't do it. So, oh, and something else we kind of missed. We we glossed over about Sam uh, about no, I'm sorry about Bash was um, when her dad came and was like, "No, I just want you to meet a great man, and I don't want you to wrestle." Yeah, and he tried to say that. Oh, me and her, we're we're engaged. Yeah, that was kind of was very, very humane of him. Like very, very, very like, endearing. You know, you kind of get a, you get a good plus for him. Yeah, that was one of my favorite scenes with Bash. Was him it, trying to do also, that. Too, there's a very slight thing like Sam, Bash has to step up as well because Sam's gone, uh, walking into. Old awful living room. And, and says, <laughs> With awful's mom. And then that the line of like, I'm sorry I tried to fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> like like that just <laughs> My mom does like board games where people die. <laughs> yeah. That was a good one too. Like, yeah. <laughs> I took a rate check on that coffee. But, but Bash <laughs> has to step up and he's like, I'm gonna be the ring announcer, yeah. I gotta do this. So uh but I did like a very subtle thing that I'm sure that'll come up in season two is the subtle thing of him taking the pink glitter and putting mm-hmm. it as an eyelash, which I don't know if that's a hint towards, you know, Bash's uh, sexuality uh, probably be coming out at some yeah. point in time, um, which, fuck, this reviewer is really going to fucking hate. Oh, <laughs> like, this fucking person that wrote this negative review, I can't wait for that fucking headline to come <laughs> The out. F-bombs are going to drop in that one. I'm oh, going to yeah, talk yeah. about fuck. Yeah, like, wait, wait, wait till you find out that the guy running the thing is, is actually uh, homosexual. <laughs> wait, wait till this fucking bad reviewer gets a touch of that. So. Which, which, if you didn't pick that up with him and Floor, I mean, come on. Exactly. So. Flora was a really good character too. That didn't really. Yeah. Have, like he was good. Yeah, there's a lot of good, good characters here. But, um, but yeah, in the final fight, 
uh, the tag match, and then the standing up in the crowd like I'll take her on, which I don't know how planned or choreographed. Like I don't know if it, this was done for dramatic purposes or this was like their hint, hint, wink, wink, the real plan after all. I I don't know that, but like it did add a sense of drama to it, and yeah. then she finally does the cross body, and it's great. And and then. That's something else we kind of glossed over is in the first match they had that she just got to the she got to the rope to do it and then just walked out because she saw Mark. Yeah, and and then of course that whole struggle of realizing like I don't really and, and that's another thing it brings up too is like in this review it's like they always have to prove that they don't need a man around and shitting on men. And it's like well so because fucking don't brother. Well he's a fucking doughy ass motherfucker. Yeah, she not you. Fuck him. <laughs> Perfect line about him. I didn't expect him to look like a grown pat, cabbage patch child. <laughs> That was, you know, get I, I might not like Debbie, but she could do way better. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. <laughs> salty Sack. She could have had Salty Sack. Salty, for sure. Yeah. Right? So, well, she could have Steel Horse. Yeah. <laughs> Did have him. Did. Could have kept, could have brought. He looks phenomenal, by the way. We didn't talk about it, but Alex Riley looked great. Hey, man. When you, you just like, eh, I'm just going to look as lean as possible when I used to look the way I used to. Trust me, I know. I'm down 15 pounds. Hey, bub. Um... But yeah, the whole final fight, and they lead to America winning and all, but then Sam being smart enough to send Welfare Queen in to realize a bad guy still has to hold the crown. Yeah. Because the money is in, in the, the chase. chase. So. Which is something we say sort of today. Sort of today. Kind of, we, maybe we don't not say, the same words. Not in the same words, but the idea is still there. Like, yeah, it, and, and, no and, one gives a shit about a baby on top. They want the bad guy to... Which... The chase is But is also, too, that might be is. kind of a swerve in the sense, too, that in this in this story, you know, Hollywood would script it that way. Yeah. But in pro wrestling, when pro wrestling is done well, it is done exactly like this. Yeah. So another thing that ties back into the thing of honoring professional wrestling as a sport and understanding it, understanding that the bad guy has to lead out and there mm. has to be that chase. Mm-hmm. So, like, I I appreciate that and like it because I'm also doing good storytelling. Look at Game of Thrones. Like, how much fucking heat the fuck Jon Snow was fucking taking. Yeah. So, that's the fucking, that's the whole point of this. So, that's what I like about it and we end there and that's where the series goes and then he's like, I'll, end, I'll roll credits on this and actually roll yeah, credits they, on they roll it. The credits and on then it. a little end sequence of him finally getting the tape in the last second. Very pro wrestling. Mm-hmm. It's very ECW-ish and yeah. getting the tape at the last second to the people that needed to air it and yeah and the show ends gotta and, rewind it yeah so yeah and then just a little bit of having to rewind it <laughs> him fucking with him was real good yeah bash, bash freaking the fuck out yeah but uh great dig it love it mm-hmm. I can't, sure. yeah can't can't say enough about it um yeah I was, I was just very very happy about it and just like it so much so. which I I don't know when they started to film it but uh I, I think it's also interesting that this comes out at almost the pinnacle of female wrestling popularity today. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if that was all planned on it or is it just happenstance. I think, it was, I think I, it's I think just it was, real awesome in which they kind of correlate right now. Well, the, the documentary that the, the writers love so much came out in 2012. Okay. So, like, you're talking anywhere from 2012 to, like, this thing was probably re- filming. and It was definitely filming, I believe, in 2016 because Mark Maron okay. was talking about filming yeah. all of 2016. So, that's like a four-year stint. So, I'm sure they... Maybe they discovered it in 2013 and started writing it. You know, 20, started in 2014, 2015. Yeah, things are starting to turn around a little bit. Rather like female wrestling, yeah. it's it's more of a global thing and stuff like that. So I'm sure they could do the proper research that mm-hmm. is needed to do that um, properly. So, yeah, I, I I liked every bit of the show. Yeah, I there was that, nothing that I was like, this is dumb. Oh, Birdie, Birdie talking about uh, what are we Jews? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. kind of oh, yeah. come on now, come on, Birdie. But, you know, it's that Hollywood liberal agenda where yeah. we have to make the conservatives yeah, of course. shit. So I, I, guess that's, I guess that's what this reviewer yeah. who we brought up a couple of times. Which, you know, thank you for writing this review because this would kind of be a... We wouldn't discuss some of the heavy topics that we did. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had a heel to this show. So. And that's what we kind of needed. We needed a little bit of conflict. Yeah. You know, we, we needed... The, the, this. <laughs> can't just be you and me talking about how great this show was for an it, hour and however long. Yeah, th- this reviewer had to fuck our boyfriend yeah. for us to have this tension. <laughs> for us... For, Poor Randy. Yeah. <laughs> leaving leaving our Randy without a dad for a little while. Exactly. So, like, we, we, we had to have some tension throughout. And I think that's discussion. Like, everybody that wants to know our opinion is like, I think it's great. And I think it's kind of on the nose about a lot of things. Yeah. Like, and the things that it's got incorrect are not completely off base. Yeah. I think they're, they're close to perceptions. And they might have been left in to appease people's perceptions mm-hmm. you know and i think that they do take some people's perceptions about professor wrestling and then twist it in the sense of what it actually is and how us as wrestlers would defend it 
So yep. that's what I like. That's what I like about this whole thing. Um, I also saw the documentary. Um, I pretty much referenced it throughout. We talked about Mondo. We talked about the rap. I didn't realize Glow was as popular as it was. Yeah. Um, you know, with them being on the Joan Rivers show, Sally Jesse Raphael, Donahue. Donahue, yep. Uh, even... Family Feud. Uh, yeah, Family Feud, Married with Children, Sly Stallone's mom got involved. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, yep. Uh, that was interesting as well. Also, too, like Hollywood posing for Playboy. That was you know a very mainstream thing as well. Also, the idea of it being a kid's show. Um, they talked a lot about the injuries, you know, they basically talked about the ring, which the ring and glow look fucking dangerous. No shit. Fuck. They were talking about how like they were all getting fucked up by it. like, uh, the one, uh, fucked up her like ACL and MCL. Yeah. Is it, uh, well, and also Susie spirit like messed up her arm. Yeah. They showed that a lot. Which cool. looked exactly like Angel Rose when yeah. she dislocated her elbow as well. Yeah. Like that's like how dangerous, like Oof. I saw, I saw And that's her, a safe ring. Yeah, and that's and they talk about the like the ropes were really low and glow. Yeah, I think they accommodate the size of the women, but mm-hmm. at the same time too, they were almost too low for like your uh, uh, Matilda the Huns. Yeah, like they probably ran in danger of falling all the way out. Um, like some of the bigger wrestlers and stuff like that, they probably had a lot of concerns of hitting those ropes. Yeah, and they probably made that a little bit danger to make it safer for the smaller ones. Also, too, smaller people in general have a hard time like absorbing the blows yeah. of a professional wrestling ring, whether it's a good ring or a bad ring or mm. whatever. Like, that's a hard thing to There's do. There's body area, like surface area. But you, you, as, as a pro wrestler, you have to have, like, a middle ground mm-hmm. in a sense of, like, your body weight. Like, I weighed, you know, 260, 270 at one point in time. The bumps were great, but the, the abuse on my joints, yeah. you know, was, was brutal. But then... When I was 183 as a wrestler, like, shit just fucking hurt more. Yeah. And right now, I'm getting dangerously close to the bumps <laughs> because I'm down to 192 right now. <laughs> Got to get on a bulk phase there, kid. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I, but that's part of the reason why I was always trying to stay around 200 pounds. Except yeah. Like, it was this nice middle room where I had the mobility to move mm. uh, with some agility, but also absorb the punishment of professional wrestling itself. Um, also, too, there's a nice heartwarming re- reunion in the documentary as well. Um, some people that were in the interview, like the David McLean's and the Matt, Matt Seamers. Um, I actually have some interesting background on Mount Fuji. Yeah. Uh, she's still alive. I didn't know if that was yeah, the payoff. She's the... still alive. And, um, this might, this might end the, the podcast on kind of a, a down note. Oh, good. Uh, Ick. but it, but it's a real fucking note. Yeah. Um, uh, Mount, Mount Fuji, uh, they talk about her being a shot putter, so I did some research because my uncle is a yeah. world-class shot putter. Um, and she talked about the boys boycott of the Moscow Games. And my uncle had to sit out because of the boycott as well. And it turns out she was on... She went to the Olympic trials. I don't know if she qualified. I think she was like fifth or sixth. So mm-hmm. I don't know if that qualified her as to be a shot putter. I think they take the top three. Mm-hmm. I don't think she necessarily qualified for the Olympics. Um, she she, she would have gone as an alternate, though. Yeah, she. I think she would have been going as an alternate yeah. or something like that. But she, she was obviously one of the the fifth or sixth best female shot putters in America for yeah. sure. And actually, she threw fifty feet in high school, which up until two thousand, only two women had done in the, in the shot put for females. So she oh, was wow. quite quite a good uh, female shot putter. She was actually in also in the movie Personal Best, which my uncle was also in, which is a movie with Scott Glenn and Mariel Hemingway about track and field. Hmm. Uh, I highly recommend that you guys check that movie out as well. And Mount Fuji's in that as well. She also made an appearance in Son-in-Law as well. Um, oh, she was the lady that fought in the barn? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So she, she's done the rounds and stuff like that. But, of course, in the documentary, there's a very sad story about her. But they... Didn't get into this story as well, and I feel like I should put this story out here as much as possible because I don't think a lot of people know this, and I had to do a lot of research and buy this, and I was pretty blown away that this had fucking happened. In February 11th of 1989, um, her family was holding a... Her sister's... She had a sister's bridal shower at her family's home address. There was some loud music. The police were called. Uh, apparently the situation was resolved, but according to the police, there was a refusal to disperse and they started throwing rocks according to the police's account. So I I should bring that up in only fairness to the police. But in response to that, uh, they sent in officers wearing riot gear, raided the house and proceeded to attack 34 of the family members so it gives you an idea of how much police force is present um 
a neighbor had videotaped the altercation. This is two years prior to Rodney King in Los Angeles as well. And this was in a predominantly Samoan community. A lot of people in the Samoan community were extremely uh, angered by this. They got together a lawsuit. Um, actually, on the videotape, you can see a shot of Mount Fuji passively standing in the street with her, they say her hand, her arms folded, but the shot that I saw in the YouTube video of the news account, she had her hands at her hips, obviously not in danger of attacking anybody, but mm. she was later attacked by the police um, shortly after that. Jeez. Uh, multiple people were beaten, and they actually showed her bruises, uh, pictures of all over her body. So there's a shot of her passively standing in the street and then... Getting the shit beat out of her. Then the bruises and stuff like that, a very, very awful indication. Like, officers are beating people up with batons and flashlights, so basically anything they can get their hands on. They're Jesus. beating up party growers. Um, and they actually went through a nine-year court battle. The family sued and won $23 million, which you give a nod, but think about it. 34 members yeah, it's not even... divide that by... that's. Just over a one, half a million. Yeah. And then, of course, you talk about legal fees for nine years. Mm-hmm. You're not getting a whole heck of nothing, a lot. basically, yeah. Um, and then also, too, if you want to be a, if you want to also take a nod to that $23 million, keep in mind that's taxpayer money yeah. being paid out. So basically, taxpayer money is paid for these people to be assaulted. Yeah. Um, uh, like I said, I don't know the circumstances of this of the party, but I think we can all agree that that force might have been a little excessive. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, you know, whether whether they were complying or not or anything of that occasion. But uh, that, that's another thing, too, is the news report says that there was loud music. It was resolved, and then the police showed up. But then the police claimed that there was rocks throwing. But uh, I haven't seen too much report other than the Wikipedia page about that. Yeah. So, But apparently in a court of law, they didn't see it that way yeah. as well either. So, um, and of course, you know, Fuji and her family said that we're just, you know, this money doesn't bring justice. This is just, we're just glad it's over yeah. and we've been vindicated in the situation. And which fuck the police. Yeah. <laughs> which, which, you know, in that time, you know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. I, I just feel like that, you know, that honesty should be put out there and that, of course. that's going on there. But like, like when you watch that documentary also too, also keep that in mind mm-hmm. that, I mean, really, they did a documentary on Glow. They could have done a documentary on Mount Fuji. Just on Mount Fuji. She has a very interesting life. And if anybody, you know, if there's anything out there that's like, you know, that you know, I believe she's still alive. She's going through a nursing home. Um, she's going through all these things. If there's anybody out there that's got a Kickstarter or anything going on <laughs> for her, like, I, I, or GoFundMe or whatever, like, I've only donated to one GoFundMe, really, mm-hmm. in my entire, entire life. And that's the one for Jerry Lynn. Mm-hmm. And if there's anything out there that's, you know, from Mount Fuji and anybody knows, please donate uh, to that. In heartbeat. She most certainly has done a lot with her life. And <laughs> we should give a little bit towards that. Yeah. If nothing else, give her love or give her respect as an individual that we should look towards because she was a pioneer mm-hmm. at, at a very unique time in professional wrestling. So uh, we're long overdue. We're very, very much into overtime, but this is something that everybody's going to ask us about. Who knows? A lot needed to be talked about. Needed to be talked about thoroughly. We covered. We covered a documentary, mm-hmm. a ten episode series. Um, I love every bit of it. I yeah. can't recommend this enough. Nope. It's right on the nose. Anything else that you have to say? Not at all. I think we. we it was just a fantastic show. Anybody that has anything negative to say about it is obviously an idiot. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like, I, I don't want to label this person who did the review as, oh, this is just right-wing conservative bullshit. Uh, this person's just an asshole. Yeah, like, it's not even... I, I know some wonderful people that, who are conservative and who are right-wing, but this person is just an asshole. Yeah. Looking... And, and also, too, like, they're... They basically write articles to piss people off. Like, one of their other headlines, I looked at some of the articles they read. Uh, another article that this person uh, wrote had the headline of H- VH1 drama has Christian character kissing lesbian is a headline for one of their articles. Also, too, another one that I thought was pretty funny is Fox Family Guy inconsistent on immigration. <laughs> uh, that's the type of person who wrote that review who we referenced multiple times. I'm not going to necessarily name that person because I don't feel like giving them power. Just fuck because him. Oh, it's a her. Oh, fuck her too. So, I, yeah, uh, assholes are assholes. Mm-hmm. And if anything, uh, feminists have taught them men are, are just as awful as, <laughs> yeah. as as women, and women are just as awful as men. Because so, equality. So, because e- equality, I don't fucking like you. I don't like your agenda <laughs> and, 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 your, and your trolling yeah. articles put out into the world. But it gave us something to push against this entire time. So, yes. I appreciate you writing the article. 
And that's what you wanted was to push against something. And we pushed back. And succeeded. And so that's how, that's how life and that's how change happens. And I feel that this... This series is going to create change, and I hope that they make a season two. And also, too, like I, I feel like young girls, if they see this, they'll be empowered by of this. Of course. Because, and that's another thing, too, that I like about this is very much the idea of women behaving badly, but also doing something athletic. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, I've always... It's positive. I, I love strong females. Yeah. Obviously, if you look at my dating history, that's that's, <laughs> that's the case. That's very much my my... My preference is strong females, and I think this very much caters to that. Yeah. And this is very much an example of that, of women doing something athletically and, and, and pushing forward. And, and also, too, like women being just as bad as guys. <laughs> this almost feels like a 80s, like a bachelor party-esque comedy. Yeah. And even like the idea of uh, women like having affairs with married men, that's no different than when Tom Hanks... Uh, and the man with the one red shoe slept with his best friend's wife. Yep. And then all of a sudden they became friends at the end of the movie. <laughs> that's, the, that, that's the only thing I was thinking of the whole time yeah. when I was after I read that review and stuff like that. So this is very much the idea of women women behaving badly. Yep. That's the big thing. That's the fun thing. And these girls do it at their best. And uh, these girls kick ass. Yep. And I hope all the people involved. Like that, It's nice to see Awesome Kong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like she's gotten a raw deal in her career. The idea that she's doing something this cool. Like I yeah. feel pretty good that she's... She's doing something like yeah, this. Yeah, of course. And the fact that Chavo, you know, he's doing something Chavo's like this. little payday out of it. Chavo's getting a nice payday. You know, John John Morris and Carlito, <laughs> Brodus Clay, all super cool guys. Every one of them got, like, every one of those guys probably, uh, maybe not so much Carlito. I don't have necessarily a personal rapport with him. <laughs> but, but everybody else I've mentioned are all wonderful, talented people that mm-hmm. are great representatives for the fresh resin business. So I'm glad that they're involved in this. Yeah. I think that probably helps to the credibility of this. Yeah. So. Anything else? Any dates you need to plug? If this is gonna no, I don't think I have right. much coming up. Uh, so Not right now. I actually have an entire tour through Florida uh, right now, so it's a plan. But just just follow me on social media. Um, I, there'll be more information about that. I'll probably put out a graphic of everywhere I'm going to be, but that's a couple weeks away. I'll be basically doing comedy through Atlanta and Jacksonville and also doing Fest Wrestling on the I'll 23rd. be there as well. You will be as well. I'll also be doing a Northeast Wrestling... Uh, this Saturday in Niles, Ohio, and then next week, the 14th, 15th, and 16th, uh, the Raleigh Supercon. Woo! It's going to be awesome! So, uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. So Have they Raleigh... told you who you're going to be yet? Oh, yes. yes. I will be... I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say. Okay, so, we'll, we'll talk about it off-air. We'll talk about it off-air, but, uh, but definitely that. So, um, as always, if we've made a mistake, or if you're the person that wrote the review and you're pissed off I didn't say your name... You know, suck it, suck it. <laughs> but also too, you can send me an email at jake at sslshow dot com, or you can tweet me at man scout manning. Also too, make sure you log on to the website how did this get booked dot com. We have t shirts for how did this get booked. Also my own personal merchandise. And as always, guys, make sure you subscribe. On iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. I think we're on Podknife right now. I don't even know what that is. I don't even know what that is. But Don's been working very hard at DSCT. Uh, dot TV. He's been working very hard at putting out as many uh, platforms as possible. I think he's Six Squirrel Studios right now. He changed his name to that because <laughs> he's no longer in Connecticut anymore, so the <laughs> CT had to drop. But uh, he's been doing a lot. He's been getting us on a lot of platforms, like I said. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, of course, YouTube, SoundCloud. Uh, make sure you follow on all those things. And please leave a review. It really, really, really does help. It's been a while since I've seen a review, so I could really, 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 really need that to help get people to know more about this program. So, Anyways, this has been another edition of How Did This Get Booked? Woo!